Once again, I'm so very thankful to see the good number who has come out to be a part of this effort tonight. I appreciate your interest in spiritual things, setting aside uh, the many things that I know that you have uh, that you could be doing right now, but there is certainly nothing more important, uh, more pressing than the things that we'll be looking at tonight and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Again, I want to thank the elders for the invitation to be here. It's been a wonderful week, growing so close to everyone here. Uh, really having, I don't believe, met anyone other than uh, Corey and his wife, probably, and it's been quite a number of years since I've seen them, uh, but I, I feel like I've known you forever already, and it's, it's only Thursday of the week. Uh, I just appreciate the wonderful hospitality, the kindness, the encouraging words, and I had a wonderful evening with all of the young people here uh, taking me out to get something to eat before services this evening. That's very special. It means a lot to me. When we were in Lubbock, we had a large number of college students, and they did the same thing for a gospel meeting, so it brought back a lot of very sweet, good memories. Uh, there had to be at least 20 there tonight, and I was uh, tremendously encouraged by that. This congregation has an exceptional group of young people, and I, I'm not just saying that. I mean it. Their attention, uh, the feedback that they give me, uh, just their interest in spiritual things, and the number of young people that I have seen here, every service, every assembly of this meeting uh, it, it is to be commended. I, I thank you so much, yeah, each and every one of you. Well, again, we have a lot of visitors here uh, tonight. Uh, last night, some dear friends, the Dans were here, and tonight, some more dear friends, the Deans are here. I, I was telling Corey, you need to schedule your meeting around whatever camp this is every year, uh, because we've got people coming into town. I'd like to believe they came for the meeting, you know. Uh, they drove from South Carolina and Georgia for the meeting. I don't think so, but I'm glad to see them, whatever the case. Uh, very much appreciate the fact that we have uh, visitors from around the area as well, uh, neighboring congregations and uh, various communities around. We appreciate your interest in, in the things that we'll be looking at tonight. I want you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6 with me. I appreciate the scripture that was read it definitely sets the tone for what we're going to be looking at tonight. As you're turning there, I, I want to make just a quick announcement I failed to make last night, and I put a chart in so I wouldn't forget it tonight, and the elders told me it'd be fine if I mentioned this. I want you to be aware of the fact that uh, there where I preach at Southside in Blue Springs, which is a Kansas City suburb, every year, uh, the third weekend of June, we have a youth lectureship, and that's Friday night all day Saturday and Sunday. Uh, we're, we're done at noon on Sunday at the end of our worship service. So it's a, it's a short, it's a very quick weekend, but it's intense. We have a lot of Bible studies. The theme of our study uh, this, week, uh, this coming uh, uh, youth lectureship uh, in June, uh, starting June 23rd is Make Me a Servant. Uh, Marshall McDaniel is going to be speaking with me in that. He'll be doing most of the speaking uh, in that. I'll be teaching only one of the lessons this year, but Marshall is uh, working with the Pepper Road Church in Athens, Alabama. He's been in the St. Louis area for a number of years. He's an outstanding man, very talented speaker, and uh, if you know anyone that's able to be in the area, I just want to invite all of you, and I, I want the young people here to know that while this is a youth lecture, that means that we're taking the gospel and we're going to be applying the, the gospel truths and principles to some of the things that you're going to be dealing with uh, at this chapter in your life. There's not a special part of the Bible that's for young people. All of the gospel's for you, as it is for me, but we're going to be speaking directly to things that you're going to be dealing with. Now, having said that, we want you to bring your little brothers and sisters and your big brothers and sisters and you bring your parents and bring your grandparents because everyone's invited to this. This is not just for young people. Everyone is invited to come uh, and, and we want, we'd love to see all of you there, uh, but, but we are looking at lessons that have especially to do with learning servitude, learning how to be a true servant as Christ showed us. Uh, so I, I appreciate your attention uh, there, and I know that there are a lot of things going on, a lot of things in the area here. You cannot uh, fail to conflict with something in the summer because everyone's having something but if you happen to be in that area or you're willing to make a special trip, we'll take good care of you. Uh, and we've got members of the church there that are going to make sure they have a place for you young people to stay. Uh, so you, you just get there and we'll take care of you. I also, uh, we, we would ask, though, that you, you register, and you don't have to do that right now. Just let me know. 
Uh, that way we have an idea of, of how many people we need to take care of. Now to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to begin reading in verse 24. And I just thought that I had uh, imported my fonts into this slide, but apparently not. But hopefully it'll all fit right. I can tell that's not my font. Matthew chapter 6 and verses 24 through 34 Jesus said, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore... Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. I want to ask, how many of you are worried about something tonight? I, I don't know that there are many days that go by that I do not have a conversation about something that is at least to some degree vexing concerning. Had one of those today, actually more than one. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's just life. And, and, and I, I think that the, the older that we get and the more things that we deal with, the more difficult it is not to be bombarded with all of these things that it's very easy to allow ourselves to start sliding down that path of worry and of anxiety. The ESV, everywhere the New King James translates worry, the ESV translates it anxious or anxiety. And that's what we're really dealing with here in this particular text. And, and as we look at this text, I think what's important is that we have a text that is a part of the greatest sermon ever recorded, the Sermon on the Mount. And the fact that Jesus devoted such a large segment of his sermon to a discussion of this subject of worry ought to reveal to us how prominent this is as a problem in life, and not only that, what a weapon it is that Satan uses against us. You know, we sometimes, I think, joke too much about worry. We, we joke it off, you know. We, oh yeah, I know I shouldn't be worried, but boy, I sure am worried about this. Well, if you know you shouldn't be, then you shouldn't make light of it. I, I, think, I think that we need to, to stop being so mocking about something that is absolutely devastating people's lives. It is creating tremendous destruction in people's spiritual well-being. And I, I've got to tell you, and I probably don't need to tell you, but I just want to say that young people are dealing with worry on a scale unseen before this age. I did not have that many things to worry about when I was their age. But because of smartphones... And the age of information, the young people today know about so many things that they have absolutely no control over, but they have a great deal of concern, even to the point of worry about these things. I mean, you look at the epidemic of suicide among young people today. I did not know or have ever heard of a young person that committed suicide when I was growing up, junior high, high school, for that matter, in college, I, I could not name someone that I knew. I can't even tell you how many young people I know of with my children growing up through junior high and college, uh, high school and, and uh, two of them out of college, one of them still in, that have committed suicide. Friends, people that they knew. I've gone to the funerals 
Why? I'm telling you it is because we, we hear about online bullying and, and all of the social media. What social media does to a large degree is it makes people worry about their identity. It makes them worry about their appearance. It makes them worry about their friends. It makes them worry about what they have. And young people have not lived long enough to be equipped to deal with that level of worry. Psychologically, they have it. We're going to have to do something different, parents and young people. It is time for a social media fast. It is time to be able to separate yourself from what this does to us because it is a weapon that Satan uses. It's, that's exactly what he's trying to do. And we all deal with worry in different realms and on different scales at different times in our life. And we might feel like we've got worry under control for a while, and then at other times, it becomes a problem. We just can't shake it. We can't get rid of it. I want you to realize, though, that we can find something to worry about at any time. At any time. I mean, over the last three years, the events and the things that have transpired since 2020, I'm seeing things happen in our culture today that I could not have fathomed a decade ago. I, and, I'm talking less than a decade ago. There are so many things that if we want to find something to worry about, we can. And if we allow ourselves to fall into the habit of worry, then we're probably going to stay in that groove for the rest of our lives. You know, when we talk about what worry is, we're talking about a word, marineo in the Greek. And as I said, it's translated anxious or anxiety in the, in the ESV, you know, in the, in the King James Version, if you're using one, you might remember or notice it says, take no thought. W.E. Vine, or excuse me, A.T. Robertson, uh, in, in his Word Studies book, uh, he speaks about this and he points out the fact that, you remember uh, Tuesday night I was telling you about how the word answer in 1 Peter 3.21 in the Old English actually meant to make an appeal in, on a, in a legal polemic platform? It's an accurate translation for the Old English, but not for our vernacular. In the same way, the word thought in the Old English actually meant anxiety or worry. So it's an accurate translation. It's just not accurate for the way that we use the word today because today we use the word thought. Uh, as A.T. Robertson said, we've narrowed the word to mere planning without any notion of anxiety, which is in the Greek word. And God is not saying don't plan for things. As a matter of fact, if we do a little bit more planning, we might have a little bit less worry. I, I, I can tell you most of the worry that I deal with in my life is a result of this terrible habit uh, that I started with as a very young man, and that's called procrastination. You know, procrastination, uh, you allow an urgency to become an emergency real fast. And it's a, it's a very ugly thing. And I shouldn't joke about that because it's, it's a terrible thing. But any, anyway, this, this idea of, of worry or anxiety is from the Greek word merimneo. And what's interesting about it is that both A.T. Robertson and Vincent in his word studies speak about the meaning of this. Arden Gingrich, as he defines the word, says it means to be apprehensive, to have anxiety, to be anxious, to be concerned. But Vincent in his word study says it is derived from the Greek word meris, which means a part, and meritso, which means to divide. And it was explained accordingly as a dividing care, distracting the heart from the true object of life. That's profound. You know, when you just read the word worry, you don't really understand what God is warning us about. But when we make that application and we understand the word that's used here literally means to divide something. And in this particular Context, it means to divide the mind, to divide the mind, a dividing care. How serious is that? A worry or anxiety causes us to be divided in our heart from our devotion to God. That's the problem. It causes us to be what the Bible calls double-minded. In James chapter 4 and in verse 8, we'll look at this again in a moment. He says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. That's the point. When I'm worried about something, 
I cannot rest my hope fully on Christ. And you can't either. You see, worry is the antithesis of faith, hope, and joy. Worry, I'm going to get personal here. Worry is the result of a lack of faith. It is the manifestation of a lack of hope. And it is the destroyer of all joy. You do not find worrisome people being the most pleasant people to be around, do you? That's not who you like to be with. They're not joyful. They have allowed their joy to be completely nuked by all the worries that they have. And why do they have worries? Well, they clearly aren't trusting completely in the Lord. And they clearly have lost hope. We were talking about suicide. I'm going to tell you, when a suicide happens, that person, for whatever reason, has lost all hope. It's hopeless. And there's not a better way to get a young person to that point than to convince them that the world came as a result of some big explosion and their life is meaningless and there's nothing after and there's no purpose for them. Well, it doesn't take very long to get to the point of no hope, if you believe that. So this is the danger of this kind of of worry. It's something that can destroy us. You know, while I have not been what my mom would call a worry wart, and that was one of her words, I have let worry and anxiety paralyze me on some occasions. Anxiety or worry is extremely dangerous, and it's just another one of Satan's tools, excuse me, to destroy us. Do you find yourself worrying or anxious about something almost every day? That needs to be an indication of something. That, that, that's a self-audit, or at least it ought to be, to where you say, hey, faith and hope should not add up to this mindset. This is not where I ought to be. So I don't know where the numbers have gotten mixed up here in an accounting metaphor. I, I don't know where the wires have gotten crossed on, in an electronic a metaphor, but I need to go back and I need to check some things. This is why the Bible tells us, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Worrying can practically paralyze us in some very significant areas of our life. I've seen it destroy parenting in mothers and fathers. You take a couple that is in tremendous financial distress. They're not going to be doing, in most cases, a really good job being engaged with their children. You know why? Because their mind and heart is divided. They, there's a part of them that is always thinking about that and deeply concerned about that. And then as a result of that, we become literally obsessed with our own concern. We can call it concern all we want, but when we become obsessed with it, when it's there every day, when we're on the phone or we're texting about it, Every day, this is not a concern. This is a dividing care, and it is a destructive force. Anxiety, the wise man said in Proverbs 12 and verse 25, anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. Depression. Has that been a very big problem in our culture? It certainly is. And it's not limited to any age today. Why do you think we're dealing with so much of that? Well, I can tell you one of the seeds of depression, and that is chronic, habitual worry. Yes, it is a habit. I want you to go back to the text that we started with, though, in the book of Philippians. And I want you to notice with me there in Philippians, in chapter 4, in Philippians chapter 4, where we read... He said, rejoice in the Lord always again, I will say rejoice. He has to say it twice. He wants us to understand how important it is to be joyful. You know, when you look in the book of Nehemiah, remember in chapter 8 when they read, when Ezra got up and he read the law and the people stood up from, from morning until midday hearing the law? Do you remember what they did when they heard the law read? They wept. They cried. It had been so long since they had heard the reading of the law. And they were, they, they were beside themselves. They were weeping. And so 
Ezra and the priests had to exhort the people and tell them, this is not a time to cry. And they said, the joy of the Lord, you remember it, is your strength. Now there's a time to cry, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. There's a time for everything. But you cannot allow even our weeping to steal our joy. If I was going to give a theme to the book of Philippians, that's what it is. Paul was saying, you're not going to take my joy. I'm in chains. There are people preaching to try to bring uh, uh, persecution to me. There are all kinds of things happening. I'm not going to let you take my joy. I've counted all things lost. I'm not going to let it take my joy. And we can't let that happen either. And that's why he starts out in this text saying, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, listen to me, rejoice. You cannot worry and rejoice at the same time. They will not exist together. That's why it's crucial that we completely snuff out that issue. Now notice verse 5. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. I want you to notice this word, this word gentleness, this is not the same word that is translated meekness in other texts. Uh, Epiekes uh, is the word that is used here. And it is a word that means moderation and forbearance. You know, a person that is filled with worry, they do not typically manifest moderation. They're not dispassionate. Usually they're snapping at somebody. They're they're on edge. They're tense. They're down. He said, let your gentleness, your moderation, your forbearance, you're going to bear up. You're going to hold up under this. Let it be made known to all men. How am I going to do that? By rejoicing in everything. I don't care what's going on. I'm going to rejoice. Now notice verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. I want you to notice the contrast between verse four, rejoice, and verse six, be anxious for nothing. They cannot exist together. They are separate There is a contrast there. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Notice that. We have something that actually will stand as a sentry of our mind. You know, a lot of times we can be trapped into this idea, this false notion that, well, I can't control my thoughts. Now, Brett's up here telling me not to worry. How do I not worry? I can't control what comes into my mind. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can have this century. You can have a guard over your heart and over your mind. And he tells us that that is going to allow the peace of God to be there. And so then he tells us, here's what you need to do. Here's what will guard your heart. Here's what will guard your mind. Think on the right things. Whatever things are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, good, a good report, If there's any virtue, anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Yes, a contrast between rejoice and anxiety. Let your moderation and forbearance be known to all. And there is a peace that guards our hearts. Anxiety destroys our minds. There really is a peace of God that surpasses all understanding. It sounds almost too good to be true, but it's real nonetheless. But we need to do more than just acknowledge that it's real. We need to show the world that that peace is real. And I want to ask you, you don't have to answer. I just, I just want you to, to consider this. How well have you shown the people that you work with, that you go to school with, the people in your family, how well have you shown your mate and your children the peace of God that surpasses understanding? Have you been someone that the world looks at and says, and that person is always just at peace? We've almost been influenced by culture to think that we need to be uptight and and we need to be stressed, you know, and and talk about what's going on with this and my health over here and my kids or my grandkids or, or, or my maid or whatever it is. 
We, we, we just begin to, you know, in, in some way, take on the colors of the world. And we're not supposed to do that. We need to be showing the world that there's something different about those who are in Christ. And one of the things that is so different from the rest of the world is that come what may, we are at peace. It is well with my soul as we have sung. That's not just something that we say. This is what we've got to be striving after is to be able to show this in every way. Peace can guard our heart. Anxiety destroys. Here's, here's what I'm getting at. We have a choice. So I don't think I do. I, I can't control this. This says you can. This says that you decide what you think about. I know I've been there. As you're trying to think on things that are noble and true and pure and just, that other thought comes running back in. What do you do? You nab it. You grab it. You know, the Bible talks about taking every thought captive. Have you ever read that, 2 Corinthians? 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he talks about taking everything captive to the obedience of Christ. We can do that. You know, our mind, there's, there's such a thing as neuroplasticity. Our, mind, our brain can actually heal itself. And it is by what we choose to think about, it can get better. And that's what Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is telling us. You choose to think on the right things. Yeah, that worrisome thought's going to come in. You stop it. You redirect. You go back to what's pure and lovely and kind and holy and good. And that thought comes in, squash it again. You're going to get tired of it, but you know what? It'll get tired before you do. And pretty soon that thought's going to quit coming in. That's what we've got to do. So what I'm saying is we have a choice if we will engage and take control. Worry can be controlled. We just have to have the will to do it. J.R. Bronger has a sermon he preaches in meetings that's entitled, Do You Want to Be Made Well? From John chapter 5 and in verse 6. He made a point in that sermon, one of the meetings that he held for us years ago. He said, you know, he said his observation was that everybody wants the cure. Uh, everybody wants relief, but nobody wants the cure. I thought that was profound. I've studied with enough married couples that were having problems to know that that's true. They want relief. They want things fixed in their marriage. They just don't want the cure. They want something else. I, I don't like that cure. I, I don't want to take that medicine. Well, there's one medicine. And you can overcome worry, but you have to have the will to do it. We have to decide that we don't want to be a victim. And we don't want a pity party. We just need God's attention. And so what we see here, if you will, in Matthew chapter 6, in verses 25 and following, is Jesus is essentially giving us a prescription for a worry-free life. You probably came tonight hoping that I just write it out for you. Well, you've got it right there in Matthew 6. It's already written out. And you can read it. It's not scribbled like doctors do. You can read it, starting in verse 25. What is the prescription that Jesus gives us? First of all, he tells us that we need to get our priorities straight. Notice it in verse 24. He says, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. What comes first in your life? I'm talking about your time, what you think about, what you search on the internet. What, what, what is it that you're most interested in? The reality is that as Christians, there's too many times in our life where we have too many temporal things at the top of the list. It may be a vacation. It may be a remodel. It may be a new house, a new car. Now, I don't know what it is, but we too often we allow those things to come first. And it's interesting to me that as he begins this prescription for a worry-free life, the first thing he addresses is our priorities and the fact that we can't have two masters. When you're trying to serve two masters, I'm going to tell you, you are going to be wrecked with worry. When you're trying to hold on to God and hold on to the temporal things of this life, you're going to be miserable with worry. You have a few good days here and there, but you're going to have a lot more worrisome days. Oh, we need to take care of those priorities. Now, don't get me wrong. 
I, I would say that the first thing, if you're dealing with worry, the first thing you need to make sure you take care of is a sin problem. You will never get over worry as long as you're carrying sin in your life. And thanks be to God. He tells us the way of the transgressor is hard. He's made it to where we cannot be fulfilled and happy and gratified when there's sin in our life. It just works that way. I remember an elder saying one time years ago, he said, I didn't raise my kids so they wouldn't ever do anything wrong. I raised them so they couldn't enjoy it. <laughs> That's what my dad did. I could never enjoy doing what I wasn't supposed to do. I mean, there, there's a passing pleasure to sin, but man, then it's, it's miserable. And, and, that's, and worry works on us in the same way. So take care of the sin problem. Once we've made ourselves right with God, then take care of your priorities. Make sure that he really is first in your life. And that's why James, we read it earlier in James chapter 4, he says in verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, there's the sin problem, and purify your hearts, you double-minded, there's the priority problem, and in the right order. That's what we've got to do if we're going to be able to overcome this issue. You know, he tells us that life is more than food and clothing. Food and clothing simply represent all the temporal things of this life. In Matthew 6, 25, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? We know the answer to that. But how often do we get just captured by the things that we want, the things we want to buy, the things that we want to have, what somebody else has got, what somebody else got to do, where somebody else went. And here again, social media is eating us up. Because I know things, actually I don't because I'm not on it, but I, I find out about things that other people are doing that I would never know before. My kids know about other kids their age all over the world. You know, when I was a kid, I knew about the kids in my little community. There was peer pressure, but you know, I mean, it was manageable. There just weren't that many people in the town I grew up in. They know about kids everywhere. And all that's doing is it's distracting our minds from the greater thing. Life is more than food and clothing. And notice with me in Matthew 13 and in verse 22. In the parable of the sower in Matthew 13 and verse 22, Jesus said, he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares, you there? See that word? Same word, merimneo. The same word translated worry in Matthew chapter six. He says, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. Concern or worry over things of this world, temporal things, will literally choke our spiritual life. Number two, Jesus tells us to learn to trust in the providence of God. Trust in the providence of God. Matthew 6.30, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? There is a song in our songbooks, in, in your songbook, it is number 379. God will take care of you. Jennifer said her mom would sing this song to her every night when she put her to bed. Be not dismayed, whate'er be time, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. Through all the uh, through days of toil, when heart doth fail, God will take care of you. When dangers fierce your path assail, God will take care of you. All you may need, he will provide. God will take care of you. Nothing you ask will be denied. God will take care of you. No matter what may be the test, God will take care of you. Lean where you want upon his breast. God will take care of you. Through every day or all the way, he will take care of you. We need to sing that when you're struggling with worry, let me recommend, you get that song, you write it down, you learn it, and you sing it. 
Because this is the very thing that Jesus says that we need to remember. God is the giver of every good and perfect gift. He's the giver of life. Acts 17 and verse 25, he gives to all life, breath, and all things. James 1 and verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. The psalmist in the 37th Psalm and in verse 25 he said, I have been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his descendants begging bread. Uh, we see God's providential care for all of his creation. Here in Matthew 6 and verse 26 through 29, he's talking about the birds of the air and we are more valuable than they. He talks about the lilies of the field. In Isaiah chapter 26 and in verse 3, Isaiah says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Listen to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 17 in verses 7 through 8. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters who spreads out his roots by the river and will not fear when he comes but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought nor will cease from yielding fruit he's saying well he's saying something you've heard before i don't know what the future holds but i know he who holds the future we can't know what tomorrow has but it doesn't matter because i know him who holds tomorrow and he holds my life in his hand First Peter 5 and 7, cast your care upon the Lord for he cares for you. It's all about waiting on the Lord. He's going to make all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. Don't let yourself fall into that habit. Trust in his providence. It may not be tomorrow. I, I mean, that's the difficult thing, isn't it? it it's kind of like when you're stuck in a traffic jam and, and there's a wreck up there, but you can't see it. You don't know how far up it is. You don't know how long this is going to last. Did they just get to the wreck? Are they just now attending to it? Or are they cleaning it up and getting it off to the side of the road? You have no idea. It'd be so nice if you could get up there in a helicopter, look down on it, and see what's going on. But we can't do that. I don't know how long this trial is going to last. I don't know how long my child's going to have to go through this. I don't know how long this persecution, I don't know how long this church problem is going to grow you know what I can know? If I have fully surrendered to Jesus Christ and I'm walking with him every day and I'm bowing on my knees in prayer every day, he's going to take care of it. It's going to be okay. I know that. Yes, God will take care of you. Trust in his providence. Thirdly, don't worry about what you can't change. <laughs> Easier said than done, isn't it? Don't worry about what you cannot change. In verse 27, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? Yeah. None of us can. I mean, it's a rhetorical question. We know the answer to that. We can't. It's not going to do anything. It'll never accomplish anything. And you know, isn't it interesting that we let ourselves worry about things that are completely out of our control? As if, if I put in a few hours of worry, that's going to move God to do what I want him to do and to do it a little bit sooner. I'm just going to tell you, that will never work. No one has ever changed anything by worrying about it. Now, if there's a concern and your planning is going to allow you to figure out where you can take action, that's positive. That's productive. Let's do that. But when we determine this is something I have no control over, I, I cannot change anything about it, oh, then I need to let that go. I need to turn it over to the Lord. My mom tells that when my two older brothers and I were all very little kids, toddler age, it was during the time when the news every evening would put up the death numbers in Vietnam. And there were young men all over the country being deployed. And there was death, it felt like, all around us. 
She said that she worried herself sick about her boys being drafted. All three of us grew up in a time where there was no draft, <laughs> no war, as far as our country was concerned. And yet she was made miserable for who knows how long, thinking that someday we're going to, we're going to be sent over there. And this is just a, one of the examples of things that that's completely out of my control. And I don't even know what's going to be happening, you know, when my kids are of that particular age. Yes, it's easy for me to look at how things are right now and to think about, wow, I mean, when my kids are adults and they're trying to raise kids, what's the world going to be like then? God will take care of you. That's completely out of my control. God can control those things. We don't need to worry about it. We take action when we can do something about it. And this, this may be the most practical and profound thing that I can give you or that Jesus gave us here. One of the first things that I recommend that you do if you're worried about something is you sit down with a pen and paper and you write down how many things here can I do something about. Just give it a little bit of time. You know, you've probably done a pros and cons thing, you know, should I make this decision? Should we make this move, you know? Let's sit down and let's make two categories. What can I control? What can I not control? And if you've got anything in that left column of what you can control, do it right now. And then you wad that up and throw it in the trash. You say a prayer and don't think about it again. It's going to dramatically change your life. Fourth, seek first the kingdom of God. In verse 33, that's what he's telling us. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and these things shall be added to you. What we've got to learn is to put the eternal before the temporal. Remember in Luke chapter 10 and verse 41, Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one is needed. That's interesting because hospitality is pretty important. And that's what she was worried about. And we ought to be hospitable. But there are times when we can, I guess I would say, have the tail wagging the dog. Does that make sense? I remember when we, when we first moved to Kansas City and working there with Southside, and, and they, they had already been having this, this youth lecture, and we were kind of assessing, you know, what, what can we do better? What, what needs to be done? And so after, after the first one, I, I wasn't really involved in. I kind of sat as a spectator and, and watched it. And so I met with the young people. I said, what do you think we can do to make this better? And one of the young people raised his hand and said, our parents shouldn't be going and fixing lunch for everybody. They ought to be hearing the lessons. <laughs> and I said, could you hold that? I'd like for your parents to be in here to hear this. <laughs> And, you know, look, I appreciated what these parents were doing, and there were families that were taking care of people, but even the kids understood one thing matters. If we don't do anything else this weekend, this is what we need to be focused on. And I was saying, amen, amen. We need to remember that. Like I said, there are important things, but there's one thing that comes first. In the book of Romans, in chapter 14, and verse 17, Paul said, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Did it strike you that out of all the things he could have said that peace and joy were two of the three that he said that the kingdom of God was about? I think we need to work a little harder on demonstrating peace and joy and joy. You know, I'm, I'm a little bit sober, you know, in my conduct. I, I'm, I'm always guarded and mindful, and, and, and sometimes I'm just not joyful enough. I, I realize it. I, I want to be more like that, and, it, and it's something that we can cultivate in our life. This is what the kingdom is about. And then finally, fifth, Jesus said, learn to live one day at a time. In verse 34, therefore do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. This is really what my mom needed to understand and she did. She understands that now. Now we've all gone through these times in our life, the young parent, the young husband or wife learning these lessons. Don't worry about tomorrow. Now I can plan for tomorrow 
and I can take action for things tomorrow, but worrying is a very different thing. That's, that's not planning. That's not taking action. Worrying is simply dwelling on and letting your heart be divided, being obsessed over something that you can't control. In James chapter 4, James said in James chapter 4 and in verse 14, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. It's gone so quick. And we waste so much time, so much time being obsessive and divided over things that we cannot control. Please see the danger in this. Somebody has said that worry is interest paid on trouble that hasn't come due. I don't like interest, <laughs> unless I'm getting it. I don't like to pay interest. And so, as a result of that, I'm going to wait until the last minute, <laughs> you know, to, to pay something uh, because I want to draw that interest on my money before I let them have it and start drawing interest. But, but think about it in that way. Worry is interest paid on trouble that hasn't come due. You're paying out of your health and, and out of your spiritual well-being on something that is not even sure to be an issue. Jesus gives us a prescription. He's written it out. It's very clear. And you and I can follow it. How blessed we are to have a loving Savior, captain of our salvation, who clearly sees, knows, and understands the power, the danger of worry and anxiety in our life. Is it a problem in your life? Are you willing to engage? Are you willing to put forth the effort to overcome it? You can do it, and we can help you. If you need our prayers if you need assistance in any way with this challenge, if, if Satan has overthrown you with anxiety and the cares of this world, let us know. We want to pray with you about that. We want to pray for you about that. If you're a member of this church, I'm, I know the elders would want to, would want to be able to set up some, some form of accountability and, and prayer and study with you to be able to get you over high center on that and get you onto a plane where you can succeed spiritually. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, all I can say is, you should be concerned. Paul said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Oh, good friend, there is something to be afraid of. But the good news is, you don't even have to leave here tonight with that concern. You can come believing in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. You, you can confess your faith in Him, repent of your sins, surrender all. And you can be baptized in water for the remission of sins, rise up to walk in newness of life, have all your sins washed away, and not have a worry on your mind. And you can do that. You can do it right now. Whatever your need is, won't you please come while we stand and while we sing.